heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Hi, Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, full earnings coverage ahead. Salesforce, it jumps after forecasting profit that topped estimates and showing signs of momentum in cost cutting. And Elon Musk says the advertiser boycott on X may kill the platform. We'll break down his comments and look at the rollout of Tesla's Cybertruck. Plus, today marks one year since the public rollout of ChatGPT, bringing AI into the spotlight and sparking a wave of investment and hiring. We'll dig in to what that one year anniversary really means. But first, let's check in on these markets because, well, we're coming to the end of the month here and what a month it has been. But in the short term, we just perhaps give off some of those profits. We see off about nine tenths of a percent on the Nasdaq. Look, the PCE, the number, the inflationary indicator coming in, basically where the market had anticipated. So they'd already priced in the good news and maybe we sell the fact. We're looking at the 10 year yield actually just bouncing up a little bit after what has been a roaring November for the bond market as well. I mean, just phenomenal by every everything rally for the November month and we're seeing crypto just giving off a little bit but look hardly any movement there we're down by a tenth of a percent moving on and I just want to give you the context of where we've been this month because an extraordinary move higher that we have seen in the Nasdaq overall and we've given well well you see over the last oh, actually this is Bitcoin over the last month that's up some nine percent Nasdaq itself up well ten percent on the month which has clearly been the best month for the Nasdaq since January and Bitcoin as well up more than nine percent really it's been an everything rally risk on and what about the individual movers today. It's been a really busy 24 hours in the earnings context with technology. Snowflake, strong outlook, boosting that stock up almost 5%. HPE up, uh, graded at Morgan Stanley, which is adding to a two-day rally. It posted results Wednesday night, you'll remember, but is showing real strength. Then a thriller for you in the storage space. Pure storage giving a weak sales outlook, that really hammering the stock. And then elsewhere, big rival Newtonix actually upgrading its billings forecast. That's supporting that stock. The main earnings story is Salesforce. And you're right. The story with Salesforce is that its cost discipline, its cost cutting is showing a real path to boosting profitability. The stock up six and a half percent, putting it on track for its biggest jump since March. Is this the Mark Benioff effect? Is this him listening to the investors and acting? Well, the stock seems to be reacting such that it is. Yeah, I mean, look at that, up more than 6%. Let's get to it with our own Salesforce reporter, bring in Brody Ford. And it does seem to be this new era of cost discipline that really benefits Salesforce. But is there underlying revenue generation going on here too? That's everybody's fear, right? I mean, it was a year ago, uh, about a year ago today, that Salesforce said that their co-CEO was stepping down. Mm -hmm. It kicked off this kind of unprecedented wave of chaos, right? Over the period of a quarter or two, we saw executive resignations, activists, investors, um, Look fear. where Brett Taylor is now. Where just, is just Brett Taylor? <laughs> right, right. Um, but yeah, and ultimately, though, they raised their profits incredibly. It made people very happy, but then it made them very scared because then revenue growth started slowing down. What we saw last night is that as long as revenue growth stays stable and profit keeps going up, well, that's good enough for now. Hey, Brody, how does AI play into that story? I know it's something that Benioff likes to talk about. Yep. Yeah, so their really big hope here with AI is that it can help bring revenue growth back up. That's immaterial for the current year, um, but they're hoping that when it comes to next year, it'll help you know upsell people on those new subscriptions, right? You got to pay a little extra to get the uh, chat bot in your apps where you can use that to automate your processes, ask it questions, bring in your favorite large language models. And so they have been pretty much putting AI into every single press release you can find and it um, you know, the cat is out on whether it will truly boost revenue growth the way they hope. Bloomberg's Brady Ford. Busy earnings season for you very covering busy. Snowflake as well. Thank you very much. Thank All you. right, the other top story. Ever since Musk agreed with an anti-Semitic post on his social platform X earlier this month, that was November 15th, the billionaire has been under fire, Caro, from the White House, several Tesla investors. But for the first time since that post, prompted the global backlash. Let's be honest, Musk has apologized for his choice of words, saying that the post was, quote, the worst and dumbest he's ever done. That was during the New York Times Dealbook conference in New York. 
He also said his trip to Israel was planned before the advertiser backlash and wasn't an apology tour. So, I mean, look, you and I were talking about this this morning at our desks. This is an apology, first and foremost, and then an expletive-laden message to the advertisers, which was basically, don't advertise. Yeah, he's not apologising to them. He might be apologising to the media, to the user base, to those that he feels have perhaps misunderstood his messaging along right. and certainly once again time and time again saying he's not anti-semitic but many will point to the way in which he interacts on his own social media platform as not being clear and consistent with that thought but putting to that to one side the fact that he can basically bring bob Iger's name into the conversation yeah. on stage expletive laced as you say and basically saying look you're the ones that are killing x meanwhile i mean many would say is he the one killing X in the respect that it's his own actions that perhaps push away some of these advertisers? But also, he's the guy who could perhaps sustain it. He's got the money. Yeah, I think, you know, there are the debt equation of Twitter and oh, X and how he bought it. There are the equity holders in X, the platform formerly known as Twitter. That Basically, what he said, and it's you know fair to point out, on November 15th, he regretted that post, mm. but he said he immediately followed up with a clarification um, that the media ignored, in his words. Uh, but, and as for Bob Iger, he basically said, hey, Bob, I'm sure you're in the audience. Um, we think that's a reference to, to Disney CEO Bob Iger, though he wasn't explicit. Yeah, um, probably they'd been together in the green room perhaps before all of that because Bob Iger had been speaking at the same conference as well. But all of this basically is noise around what is going to be a big main event for one of his key companies, Tesla. We just referenced how some investors have been concerned about the way he's been behaving on his social media platform. And we want to be bringing in Craig Trudell now on the fact that actually what he wants to dominate the headlines today is a Cybertruck unveiling, right? I don't think he'll have any trouble uh, doing that, of course. It's a, a, a pickup that uh, made an awful lot of headlines. Uh, going back uh, four years now, right? Uh, so th this was a, a truck that they showed uh, very famously or, or infamously, I mm. guess, depending on your view, uh, through the metal ball at the windows. They cracked. Uh, you know, I think a, a lot of people who were in the room sort of gasped when this uh, truck was first shown and, and you know, some weren't really sure how serious it was. Uh, it's, it's dead serious. It's uh, finally ready uh, for deliveries a couple years late. Uh, but it, it's, it's no question that uh, this one's uh, sort of a, a head turner and, and uh, you know, sort of as, as polemic uh, a vehicle as, as they come. You know, Craig, the, the pickup category, be it electric or combustion engine, is just sacred in North America. And, you know, Dana Hall's written really smartly about how Musk has been signposting for like years that this is really ambitious. It's not going to be easy to build. Yeah, and I, I think she did a great story this week, uh, you know, really drawing parallels between, uh, you know, this is their first pickup. They had a, a first SUV uh, years ago, the Model X, that uh, there's a lot of uh, similarities in the way Musk has talked about these two. Uh, you know, with the Model X, you know, he talked about, you know, regretting the fact that they sort of overloaded it with technology. And then he's gone on to say that he's overloaded uh, the Cybertruck with an awful lot of technology. So there's a lot of ways that this, uh, you know, manufacturing this pickup could go sideways. I think he's uh, really sort of, you know, gone out of his way to bring expectations down in terms of how quickly they'll be able to scale this up. Uh, when they'll be able to do so in a in a way that's not you know burning through lots of cash, and so you know I think you know we may be surprised. Uh, there are some people who you know think that this thing is kind of hideous and and uh, a bit of a monstrosity. There are some who think it's really really cool. Uh, I, I think you know there's probably going to be no trouble here with demand. For me, the question is how the heck are they going to scale this thing up and overcome the various manufacturing challenges that he's flagged going into this? Craig. We thank you, Bloomberg's Craig Trudell, on what is going to still be, I'm sure, a much posted about uh, commentary when it comes a little bit later. Meanwhile, coming up, we're going to be unpacking the latest in the land of AI development and policy, reflecting on, remember, the anniversary, one-year anniversary of ChatGPT, the craze that's been. Sarah Kreps is with us, director of Cornell's Tech Policy Institute. This is Bloomberg Technology. Sam Altman is officially reinstated as CEO of OpenAI and 
It has a new initial board of directors, with Microsoft now joining as a non-voting observer. All of this happening one year to the day after ChatGPT was released and made it accessible to the public. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Rachel Metz. Uh, lots of news out overnight, and you had an interview with Sam Altman. They did. Yeah, there's a lot going on at OpenAI. Uh, a lot of it is rubber stamping, in a sense, things that we had already learned. Um, that Sam Altman is now officially back at the company as its CEO. And um, Greg Brockman, who had been president, is also back at the company. Mira Marathi, who was very, very briefly interim CEO, is now back as uh, chief technology officer. Um, and a bunch of other things that you just recapped. I'm a whole bunch of other things. I mean, notably, Microsoft comes on as a non-voting observer, still a lack of diversity at the interim board level, as we can currently see. But I'm interested that they are saying, and certainly Brett Taylor was writing alongside Sam Altman in a post that, look, prepare yourself, we are going to be diverse, and we're also going to look into why any of this upheaval happened to begin with. Yes, absolutely. So on the first point, um, diversity and just enlarging the board, um, when I spoke to Sam yesterday, and also I got to speak briefly to Larry Summers, who's one of the new board members, they both said that they're planning to enlarge the board significantly, wouldn't give a number on how many people will be in it eventually, um, but they're definitely planning to add people. Um, as to the other point that you were making, um, now I'm blanking on what that was. <laughs> Let's go back to that one. I mean, it's so, it, what you have covered and the amount that you have covered over the last few days, no wonder you're going to be blanking, but really Larry, Larry Summers coming on board, many feeling is sort of like uh, the experienced board director and himself thinking about the way in which this, this board can be expanded and thought upon. And he says, like, give us a minute. We've only been in the board, interim board for about half an hour, I think, was the quote that he gave you. Rachel Metz, we thank you so much for your time and, and of course, continued conversation that she manages to have with these key executives. Let's get another key angle from Sarah Kreps, Professor of Government and Director of Tech Policy Institute over at Cornell University. And Sarah, you yourself were, you were back in the day before OpenAI became a, a for-profit business. You were helping alongside early OpenAI employees co-author research documents thinking about ultimately how generative AI can work hand in hand and, and be good for humanity. How has the era of chat GPT fast forwarded what you thought was achievable in artificial intelligence? Right. No. So I started working with OpenAI back in 2018 when it was still the nonprofit. And then in 2019, it became the for profit. And I've but but I think as a company, it's really almost only a year old because there, it was so formative in that time between 2015 and 2022. Most people hadn't heard of it. We were writing and researching. And then in 2022, ChatGPT became this consumer facing platform that was so easy to use, so user friendly, and it just took off. The fast setting records for its uptake, 100 million users within the first two months, and now 100 million users per week, which is really astonishing. It's incredible to track how far we've come in the space of the year, but much of the last two weeks events put the spotlight on what's to come next, the next generation of lang large language model. On the board issue, this is what Brett Taylor, who is interim chair of OpenAI's board, said, we will build a qualified, diverse board of exceptional individuals reflecting OpenAI's message from technology to policy, that last bit, technology to policy. Why is the makeup of OpenAI's board important to their success in developing the technology? Yeah, I think what we saw in those two weeks, in these last two weeks, was just that kind of tug of war almost between the two visions of what AI should look like. And there have been a lot of discussions about how much of that was just kind of a myth and outsiders reading things that weren't there. But it does seem like there are these two real philosophies about how quickly to move and that the philosophy about moving quickly seems to have won out. And I think what the board should do or its intended role is to be kind of a rudder in choppy waters or what could be choppy waters. Uh, but I think where the nonprofit or the former board got in the way was that its vision was so at odds or seemed to be at odds with not just the direction open AI is going, but AI in general. And so I think right now we're in a real arms race and the, I think, legitimate perspective of the open AI people who have stayed is that this technology is developing quickly, whether we're on board or not. 
And so we might as well be, we open AI, be leading and trying to do it responsibly. So, it, you know, the nonprofit, or what was the not, what is the nonprofit board, but the former board, I think it wasn't that they didn't want to develop AI, but I think they just had different ways of doing it. So the new board will come in and try to, I think, be more compatibly aligned with that, with the direction that the company and with the direction that AI is going. And of course, much of the hand-wringing around AI and safety has been a worry about bias. That is why many people are saying you need to have minorities at the table. You need to ensure that all voices are heard here. We, we re-established the interim board as it stands, looks pretty undiverse, one of them being Larry Summers, of course, a paid contributor of Bloomberg. I'm interested as to what you think, Sarah, will be the next iteration. Will OpenAI be able to be as agile going forward, do you think, after this? No, I think that has to be a real goal. And I, I think for them, and in general, that diversity is not an end in itself, but it does give you different perspectives. It, it, some of the early versions of AI really did, I think, warrant some criticism about bias and discrimination. So I think there is a lot of attentiveness to that. So it's important for that board to be able to red team different ideas and present different perspectives without being misaligned. I know alignment is a big term in the AI world, but just kind of contributing to a, a different set of perspectives that can kind of be a force for good while not holding back the, the technology. Sarah Kreps, Professor of Government and Director of the Tech Policy Institute at Cornell University. Thank you so much. This is Bloomberg Technology. to the intersection of artificial intelligence and healthcare. Philips is exploring the technology's potential in when, of course, when it comes to wearables, imaging, hospital task automation. We're pleased to welcome to the show Roy Jacobs, who's Philips CEO, marking one year at the helm of the company, a company that is now fully focused on the medical use and healthcare applications. And AI is a key driver in that. Just tell us how already you're working with, well, the departments uh, in some ways of those that are looking at tracking using an aura ring or whether it be a Garmin watch. How are you already working with governments and indeed consumers? So we are um, in our monitoring uh, business. We have a, a strong collaboration where we can actually uh, include all the data from uh, any Apple devices, or rings um, uh, devices that they're using in the house or in the home um, to insert that into a patient context to understand how that actually makes a better diagnosis or full patient picture. Um, we also remotely monitoring in the home, for example, for cardiac uh, rhythm uh, problems to early pick up signals that can actually then prevent deterioration later. Um, so bringing care to the home is a big part of what we're doing, uh, making sure that actually we start the journey as early as possible so that actually you can prevent deterioration. But then also in the hospital you see that actually AI is picking up very quickly. Um, just coming out of Chicago where we had a very big show around how we can improve imaging because there's a huge demand for, um, uh, for more images, but actually the hospital sector is really uh, challenged to have enough radiologists or technicians to do all the scans. Yeah. So that's where AI can come to the rescue to really make a productivity difference. I think of how I use my connected wearables and some of that's to track my sleep. Now I want to shift gears a little bit because there has been a safety issue involving your dream station too. This is about sleep apnea and the machine there. The FDA having a surge in reports of overheating, worrying about fire smoke burns. There's also been other concerns around your sleep apnea products. How are you tackling that as the CEO right now? Yeah, when I came into, um, into office, I said, first priority is patient safety and quality. So I put a world-class team on it uh, to work through the challenges. We also said we need to get very proactive in identifying what is out there so that actually we can address it and put the quality norm up. So it's about how we identify and then make sure that we, across the company, provide the best quality care and make sure that in the daily practices, when we work with customers and in the context that they have, we can make sure that actually they can rely on our products. So that's something we have been doing in our uh, strategy. You also have seen that from the recent quarters, we have been seeing quite an uptake in the performance of the company because we have been able to uh, start growing again. Now we have four quarters of growth 
um, we have upped the guidance twice, but also that was under the premise that patient safety and quality, supply chain improvements and simplification of the organization are really important to drive better impact for care. Mr. Jacobs, good morning from San Francisco. That, that issue, the most recent, was on the thermal issue of your current generation, but it's kind of brought back the discussion about the recall of two years ago over the polyfoam deterioration. There's a large body of academic work that shows a latency in the cancers that arise from exposure to deteriorating polyfoam periods of 20 to 40 years down the road. Is Philips conscious of that latency? So we have um, done extensive testing towards uh, the health risk of degradation of the PEPR foam. We've also come forward with our testing, which actually shown that there's no appreciable harm from the usage of our devices. So that's something that we have done over a two-year period with very strong um, uh, evidence created together with the best scientific bodies, external bodies and toxicologists to make sure that actually we have no patients, uh, patient safety harm for our um, users. Also from there we have been uh, uh, working with the whole group of healthcare providers uh, that we currently are addressing to make sure that patient safety and quality is the first priority. Um, that actually also transmits into how you can use AI to improve the daily practice of AI. Because if you look at what AI can do, actually can help you read and interpret images in a more accurate fashion. Can also make sure that the radiologists that are reading from home nowadays, 70% is reading from home, can get access to the images and then make sure yes. that they have the appropriate uh, interpretation support with AI before and after their read. Uh, Ms. Jacobs, you've set aside 1.1 billion for remediation and half a billion for, for lawsuits. Is that sufficient or will you have to add to that? So we have been um, dealing with the recall. We made great progress. We actually have now remediated the sleep patients and actually we are getting back into providing sleep products outside of the US to our patients. So we have provided for that. That actually is also um, been sufficient to date. We took economic uh, loss provision early this year that actually also will be effectuated uh, next year. And then if you look to how we are getting the rest of Philips to where it needs to be, we have been making significant progress with um, the profitability that went up. We have guided uh, or increased our guidance now twice for this year. We are heading towards 6 or 7% growth rate this year, both from health as well as from the consumer health side. So we're actually getting the company back into a growth and contributing level. And we do that on the back of our innovations that have real meaningful impact in the healthcare challenges of today, where they have a massive productivity gap that they need to address, where our technology and AI comes to the rescue. Roy Jacobs, Philips CEO, wish we had more time. This is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. Ed Ludlow here in San Francisco. Caroline Hyde in New York. Let's get a check on these markets because halfway through this trading day, look, a little bit of profit taking maybe after we come off a stellar month. The Nasdaq had its best month since January. We're up about 10%. Look, we pull back a little bit, but not quite a percentage point on the Nasdaq 100, off by nine tenths of a percent. We're seeing the bond market seeing significant action on the day, up seven basis points. But remember how far, how fast we've come. Basically, the best month for the bond market since the 1980s. And therefore, you're seeing this sort of everything rally risk assets pushing higher as everyone anticipates a Federal Reserve that just cools down on its rate hiking path indeed starts cutting as soon as May. We're looking at what's happening in the risk asset of choice in the technology market, which is Bitcoin. It's currently off by just about a tenth of a percent as the dollar just kicks up a little bit. But remember, it's been a story of dollar weakness on the month of November too. Move on, look at some of the individual names that we're looking at on the day. And look, I shine a light on some of the key movers like PDD. What now? Eight-year-old startup from China, now worth more from a market cap position versus Alibaba more than $188 billion. It eclipses it. We're up 3% on the trading day. I'm looking at what's happening also in terms of some numbers. Synopsis had actually been doing well before the market opened. They then pull back, even though they're managing to post ga gains. Remember, this is all about electronic automatic... De this is about design, automation design, and particularly around the world of chips. They might be selling off some parts of the business. So we're looking at a, currently a pullback of about 3% for that particular business. And lastly, I'm looking at what's happening with NVIDIA because well, we're all thinking about artificial intelligence and chips more more generally and it seems as though actually a lot of these chip related names in the world of artificial intelligence said are just off a little bit nvidia pulling back by some three percent as well over to you
Those are the public market moves. There are big moves in private markets, big Series A. Together, AI, a research-driven AI company working for more open source models and data sets, just raised $102.5 million in a Series A round led by Kleiner Perkins. Other investors who participated in the round include NVIDIA, Lux Capital, Graycroft, and a few others you can see there on your screen. Kleiner Perkins partner, Bucky Moore, and Vipul Bed Prakash, CEO and co-founder of Together AI, both here with us in San Francisco. Uh, you want to offer a place where you can take a custom model, an open source model, and build it affordably. I think Bedrock, AWS, because of this week and what's been in the news flow, what are you trying to build? Uh, first, thank you so much for having us here. Uh, you know, at Together, we believe open source is a big part of AI's future. So what we've built is a very optimized cloud platform for building generative AI applications on open and custom models. Uh, you know, we provide APIs where uh, we have hundreds of models prepackaged that users can use, and we provide sort of best-in-class tools to allow companies to um, build their models from scratch or take an open model and adapt them with fine-tuning for their purposes. Uh, Bucky, it's a, a big check, a few checks for a Series A. You know this space better than many. You're taking on the hyperscalers, and you're trying to offer something at a better price than they are. Uh, but you're confident that this Gather AI can do that. So you've been covering this space for a reason. This is a fundamentally new form of computing that is going to be as disruptive as internet and mobile. And with respect to Together... Like an OS, basically. Absolutely. And with respect to Together, what we're seeing is enterprises are now leaning in on wanting to build on these open source and custom models. And to do that, they're going to need a platform upon which these models can run. And we think Together is that platform. I'm interested, Vipul, from your perspective, the what we like to categorize perhaps in the media is this tension between open source and closed models. And I mean, the open source movement is as old as software itself, people. But I am interested in the perhaps car crash of a story that we had a couple of weeks ago around open AI. Suddenly, corporates are thinking about business continuity, about ensuring that perhaps they're not dependent on one particular LLM provider. Has that changed any of the conversations you're having with corporates? I would say it certainly illustrates the need for a choice. Uh, you know, companies that are building their strategies around generative AI want control of their models. They want to own the output uh, of their efforts, and open source is, uh, you know, a way, it's a great way of doing that. Bucky, from your perspective, it, it can be more resource intensive, though to sort of manage your open source code in some way. And, I, and I'm interested in how companies are really going to end up aligning when it comes to their own proprietary data and building on these open source models. So first of all, open source AI is really history repeating itself. Businesses have been leveraging open source in the form of databases and other core underpinnings of how they develop their software for decades. So again, this is history repeating itself. And in that sense, Yes, there is some operational burden that a company has to take on to leverage open source relative to a managed service, but this is precisely where Together's technology comes in. They want to make that piece easy and take it off the hands of enterprises so they can realize all those benefits without the operational burden. Uh, Vipul, you've got NVIDIA as an investor, fantastic, but have you got them as a technology partner? Do you have a big old bag of H100s that you can sling over the shoulder and, and call yeah. it a day? Everyone wants that. But, right. Uh, you know, they, they are our technology partner. NVIDIA is really a leading company in the space. I would say they are the platform today for, for AI everywhere. Well, were there other options to you? I mean, I, I guess considering what you're trying to build, right, the, the, the whole business uh, offering from you, were there any alternatives other than NVIDIA to get the compute needed to build a platform like that? There aren't today. There, uh, we, we care a lot about price performance, so the services we provide for well, our inference service is six times cheaper than OpenAI's. Our training services are four times cheaper than AWS, and we're able to do four this. Four times cheaper four than times AWS. Cheaper than AWS. Can you absolutely guarantee that? Absolutely guarantee that, yes. And this is both a combination of our hardware stack as well as the software that we have built on it to make training and uh, inference more efficient. Bucky. There has been much said about the hype, dare we call it, around artificial intelligence. What draws you to a team like Vipul's? Is it talent? Is it what they've already been putting out there in terms of innovation? Is it how they look to be using a very large check that you've all managed to put together? 
So Caroline, when we've thought through what it takes to emerge as the leading provider of platform infrastructure for all of these businesses who we believe will be leaning in on open source and custom models, we really think it requires this unique combination of systems engineering and research talent. And both of those have to come together in a world-class way to really build that market leading product. And Together is the first company we've seen that really brings that to the marketplace in that manner. And that's why we're so proud to be their partner. They pull the money. What will be allocated towards talent? How expensive is talent at the moment? And is it all being brought together to bear where you sit now over on the West Coast? Or are you looking more geographically? Um, you know, the, the capital one, we are going to do you know, deep investments in product. Uh, uh, you know, what, as Pakeem was saying, we have a very uh, deep research effort. We are a research-driven company. We invest a lot in, uh, um, you know, core AI research to build better models, build better model architectures, build better data sets, um, and, and build, build a better platform. So that will be a continued investment. And yes, I think the uh, talent market is, uh, you, you know, very tight today. Uh, but we have uh, some of the sort of leading researchers in the space are our co-founders and part of the company, and that really helps bring, bring together the research community and, and have them attached to the company. Bucky, what I always find interesting is, is the rationale of making investment based on what's put in front of you, right? With the greatest respect, Together AI is not a massive company. How much weight do you put on the, the individuals they have from a talent perspective? Everyone's got GPUs. There are very few data scientists or engineers that can actually make them work, from what I understand. So look, at this stage, startups are all about the people behind them. And this is a world-class team, as I said, that brings together this unique combination of systems engineering and research talent that we think is the most potent combination to go and build a market-leading company in this space. And that's what we're excited about here. i just ask you both very quickly. Uh, it is one year to the date, uh, day since ChatGPT was, was released, Vipul. How, how has the last 12 months changed or accelerated what you've tried to do in AI? I think it has uh, it was a moment that made it very clear the power of foundation models and their applicability. Uh, and that's really sort of, you know, uh, created a huge market around an interest uh, in large generative models. Fascinating from both of you. Always Bucky Moore with your seeing round corners when it comes to infrastructure and the future thereof, particularly when it comes to the world of AI. We thank you, Kleiner Perkins, partner there. And Vipul Ved Prakash, of course, CEO and co-founder of Together AI with that 100.25 million Series A. Meanwhile, coming up, let's talk about the social media and, well, we've got to think about how it implicates child safety online. We're going to be talking about how tech CEOs have been called to Capitol Hill to testify on exploitation, Ed. Taking a quick check on shares of Meta, down more than 2%. The whole market kind of took a weird turn at some point in the session, but the company plans to appeal a district court decision rejecting its attempt to block the FTC from modifying a 2020 settlement with the agency that required the company to update its privacy practices, something that's playing out in court and drawing no causal link, but it is interesting to see Meta under pressure. This is Bloomberg Technology. All right, time for talking at tech. First up, move over Alibaba. It's lost its spot as China's most valuable e-commerce company to Pinduoduo. Best known for its shopping apps, Timu and Pinduoduo, the eight-year-old PDD has gained more traction with investors while growth for Jack Ma's Alibaba has softened a big story of the week. And if you're a fan of NASCAR. You'll now be able to stream the racing sport online. NASCAR signed deals with Amazon and Warner Brothers Discovery to show its races on their respective Prime Video and Max streaming platforms. The deal reportedly valued at $7.8 billion. Plus, Morgan Stanley CEO James Gorman will now have a seat on Walt Disney's board of directors. Gorman's appointment will take effect on February 5th, 2024. The move comes ahead of an expected proxy fight and amid reports of interest in a board seat from billionaire Nelson Peltz. Veteran media executive Jeremy Darrock will also be appointed to Disney's board effective January 9. A former Sky CEO, Caro. Let's... 
take a turn and talk about some of the other executives across well, technology at large right now, but in particular the CEOs of Meta, of X, of TikTok, of Snap, of Discord. They've all just been summoned, dead by the Senate Judiciary Committee to testify at a hearing on child sexual exploitation that's now been given the date of January. This comes just a few weeks after Meta, of course, was sued by California, a group of more than 30 states over claims that its social media platforms exploit youths for profit and feed them harmful content. It's a sensitive discussion, and we're going to have it with Camille Carton, Center of Humane Technology Senior Policy Manager. And all of this comes at a time, no matter where you're seeing the lawsuits coming from, whether they're the families, whether they're coming from, of course, ultimately AGs, whether they're coming from a federal level, all of them, are they likely to disrupt the business models of these companies enough that we do see greater protection in whatever guise you might want to see it happen, whether it's internally if you're working at the company or externally using their products? Yeah, I think what we're seeing right now is that we are absolutely at an inflection point, which is what you just described. Whether it's research that has been done by whistleblowers, um, researchers themselves, whether it's the lawsuits from AGs, from parents, school districts, we are just seeing overwhelming kind of support for these platforms to take on much more responsibility for them to be accountable to their actions and for them to change the way that they design their products. Mm -hmm. Right now, these products are designed to capitalize on children's vulnerabilities, the things that make their development different than older users. And we know this from these disclosures. And so that's exactly what people are looking for when they're going through with these lawsuits and with these testimonies. When we think of the testimonies, when we think of Judge Yvonne Rogers has allowed them to proceed in some way. Many would say actually the decisions that they've made means that much business model disruption won't happen. The fact that the endless scrolling isn't going to be something that's focused on, but it will be more about protection and ultimately oversight from parents. Is that going to be enough? And how do you think, if you think about the other side of what Meta and other companies would say is, you know, what, what wheel building isn't wrong, it's the way in which humanity uses it that is wrong. How can we get the a better balance between the two? So I think the most important thing is to look at the incentives, right? These companies right now are incentivized to design their products with profits first. But we have tons of legislative solutions out there. We have COSA at the federal level that has over 50 bipartisan co-sponsors. We have the Age Appropriate Design Code that's been in place in the UK, it was introduced in California. You mentioned Judge Yv uh, Yvonne Rogers. These solutions look at actually changing the way these platforms are designed. They look at how can we change these platforms so that kids' best interests are put forth first. We, they focus on privacy. They focus on changing features that are addictive. And they also provide a duty of care, basically requiring platforms to prioritize the best interests of kids over profits. And I think that's the best way forward here. Camille, you, your position, and, and it's shared by others, is that social media platforms are deliberately designed as pieces of technology to be addictive to children and teenagers. Have I got that right? Yes. TikTok, as an example, set out a policy in March. That policy was that you have to be age 13 or a different age, at least, depending on local law restrictions, to use the platform. Aside from legislation and, and the policies of companies like TikTok, what fixes would you recommend to, to safeguard teens and children? What technological solutions are there? Yeah, this is a great question. And TikTok has this policy as well as Facebook and many other platforms. But what we're learning from many of these disclosures related to the attorney's general investigation is, for instance, Meta actually knows that they have millions of underage users. They have millions of users under the age of 13, which is in violation of federal law, that they are collecting data on. Not only do they know this, they are taking great lengths to make sure that the public doesn't know that they know this, and they're studying these users. They're capitalizing on these users. So these platforms already have a way of knowing who is and isn't on their platform, but they're choosing not to do anything about it, and they're choosing not to make sure that underage users are not accessing products that are not built for them. Uh, in January, on January the 31st, I believe, a number of CEOs will go to Capitol Hill for a, for a Senate hearing. When executives go before lawmakers, what is it that you hope comes out of public hearings like that? How does it move the agenda forward? 
I think that this is a really big opportunity for policymakers to push these executives on the fact that they know they have users that are on their platform that are not supposed to be. The fact that we now have evidence that they are intentionally designing products in ways that are harmful to users. For instance, Arturo Bihar, who was the most recent Meta whistleblower, shared that one in eight young users under the age of 16 experienced unse unwanted sexual advances. And despite Meta knowing this, instead of designing a reporting mechanism for users to be able to report this to Facebook, for, uh, sorry, to Instagram, for Instagram to be able to fix what was going on, they intentionally designed a reporting flow that was really hard for users. It took a lot of effort, it was really long, and they took out all human oversight. So young users are essentially not incentivized to report this anymore because the company doesn't do anything and the company is no longer being flagged about these issues that are happening. So I hope that these sessions, we can actually get to the bottom of the fact that these companies know that some of the product designs are harmful and that we need to end this practice. Camilla, I'm sure we will go forth to these companies' leadership and say as to how they have been responding because I'm sure they'd like to say a response to as to whether or not indeed they have been trying to make it more or less difficult for these sorts of things to be reported. But Camille Carlton, we thank you so much for your insights, the Centre of Humane Technology, of course, and we'd potentially like to be getting you back ahead of that January the 31st uh, up on Capitol Hill. And what have we got coming up? Yep, a big interview. Robin Hood is launching commission-free trading of US stocks, but in the UK, we're gonna hear from the CEO, Vlad Telev. That's next. This is Bloomberg Technology. Robin Hood's making its international debut, launching commission-free stock trading in the UK. The firm has started rolling out trading of more than 6,000 US listed stocks and other securities to British retail investors. CEO Vlad Tenev spoke to Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie. So we have products for customers that, uh, who, who have low risk appetite for financial risk as well. And I think we can serve their needs um, but I, th I think there's two things we do exceptionally well in the U.S. that carry over in the U.K., despite any cultural differences. People in the U.K. love easy-to-use, compelling mobile interfaces, and they love getting the best possible economics on investing and other financial services. And I think um, these two things have been the cornerstones of Robinhood product design and development. We have really a beautiful, our, our customers love the beautiful, almost magical quality of the Robinhood experience, and they appreciate the, the fact that they're getting industry-leading economics. And when we talk to customers in the UK, there's a lot of enthusiasm over bringing these things to, to this market. It, it, has crypto bottomed, do you think? And is it worth still being in the crypto space, given what's happened with the likes of Binance and, and FTX? Or is that an opportunity for Robinhood to take market share? I, I think um, in the long run, it's, it's certainly an opportunity. And it's good for the industry to have unscrupulous actors weeded out and kind of falling off. Um, because I think in order for the industry and the technology to become truly globally accepted, uh, there has to be a foundation of regulatory compliance and it has to be integrated more and more into uh, the traditional financial system and, and help solve real problems for people. So Robinhood continues to build crypto technology and be a leader there. We've been pleased with the growing market share we've been seeing in the U.S. even through the winter. And um, as you probably know, in the U.K., we're not launching with crypto. Mm -hmm. um, we're very focused on U.S. shares and, and the high interest product with no FX fees. Um, but we are also expanding in the EU and we will have uh, crypto available in the EU in the coming weeks. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology, Ed. Bloomberg Technology Podcast. Check it out wherever you get your podcast from New York City and SF. This is Bloomberg Technology. Bloomberg Technology.